The next presentation is with Dr. Vittorio Minna, how to keep a brain healthy, an oral game plan. I'll be your moderator and host tonight. My name is Dr. Ariel Serenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Vittorio Minna. Uh, he is the sports vision director at Optical Academy in Clifton, New Jersey. He also serves as, as an advanced clinical director for the Special Olympics Lions Club International Opening Eyes Program for the state of New Jersey. He graduated from Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salus University in 2014. And he is also on the board of directors for his state association, NJSOP. In 2019, he was awarded as the New Jersey Young Optometrist of the Year. And then in 2020, he received the Public Service Award from his alma mater. On the start of 2029, 2021, he was announced to the AOA's Sport and Performance Vision Committee. So thank you so much for speaking with us, Dr. Minna. We really look forward to your presentation. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for everybody for coming on and for having me on. So uh, here are some of the disclosures. So again, how to keep a brain healthy and oral game plan. And so as you as mentioned, uh, I'm on the AOA sports vision performance section. And so um, I actually went into optometry because of that small little niche of optometry for sports vision. And so when I was a student as a third year in PCO, I was actually the national liaison of the sports vision section. And so um, coming out of graduation, I actually worked for two years at an office, the private practice that actually saw the New York Giants. And so I left there and now I work with Optical Academy and, and I work with um, the school districts. I really get to talk to the athletic trainers, the coaches, the principals on the importance of, of um, sports goggles, contact lenses, making sure that the, the appropriate wear is on for their, their sports. And um, so if you notice these, these uh, guys on the right hand side, these are a lot of my mentors that are in the sports vision world. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, is, is it just a guy arena when it comes to sports vision? And not necessarily because our past AOA president for the sports vision section was actually Dr. Amanda Nanasi, and she's actually the team doc for uh, the Miami Dolphins. So a lot of the things that I'm sharing with you is things that I've learned um, through them and, and through my own um, path in learning. So I hope you enjoy what we got for, for you today. So again, these are my disclosures. Um, none of the companies that I am talking about here are actually paying me for this talk. So this is just um, free information for you guys. This is just something that I really think that I should share with you guys as clinicians. So we are our brain. So pretty much the things that we eat, it's not really the things that we eat, it's the things that we are eating are eating. So pretty much whatever chicken or cow is eating, we're pretty much digesting in our body. So a lot of times, a lot of people don't even realize that our brain and our gut are actually tied together. So there's that gut brain access, and that's actually tied with our vagus nerve, it's our cranial nerve number 10. It's the longest cranial nerve in our entire body. And so what happens is if our gut is not aligned properly, our brain gets damaged. And so the two biggest components, serotonin, as you guys know, is the happy molecule, right? It helps us with our moods, and melatonin helps with our circadian rhythm. The crazy part is that majority of those chemicals are in our gut. So if our gut is misaligned, our brain is actually getting damaged because of the things that we're eating. And it all comes down to our gut lining. And so with our brain, our brain is actually made up of 60% of fat. Most of that fat is actually DHA. Majority of it is DHA because that's what our brain. The other component I usually ask to the audience, like what is the other component when it comes to fat? And I'll wait for an answer. But the other component is actually arachidonic acid. So again, 60% of our brain is made up of fat. So we need to be supplementing or eating properly so that we can protect our brain. Because again, what do we see with? Our brain. So this is very important. So here's me uh, at my, uh, my wedding day. So that was nice. So pretty much the outline here is treat your body like a Maserati. The reason why I show you this is because I want you to think of you as a sports car, right? If you have a sports car or a fancy vehicle, are you just giving your fancy vehicle regular gas? No. So the same thing with our bodies. We need to be incorporating good food in our bodies so that we live a healthy life, right? So it pretty much comes down to. So we need to do all these things in alignment because if they're misaligned, that's where inflammation happens and disease and all these things occur. It really comes down to, you know, the, the, the adage of food is thy medicine. Well, food is really the medicine. Here we got a quote from Buddha. Um, with your body is precious. It is your vehicle for awakening, treat it with care. 
So true or false, I usually ask the audience, but here we're not asking, I don't have those fancy gadgets to ask you a poll, but just answer this while you're watching this lecture. Having a healthy diet and taking part in exercise means we will live long and healthy lives. True or false? Whatever you, you answered, well, here we go. So we got Winston Churchill on the left-hand side. He was heavily obese, very famous for drinking alcohol daily and always smoked cigars. And then we got Bruce Lee, martial artist, famous for his one finger push-ups. Well, Winston Churchill, heavily obese and smoked, died at age 90. Bruce Lee died at age 32. Now, this is an unfair comparison. Why? Because we don't know what would have happened with Bruce Lee for a little longer age. Um, so the reason why Blue Street died actually is because uh, he died in 1973. And so what happened was is he actually had severe um, seizures and headaches. And so he was prescribed mannitol to reduce the cerebral swelling that he had. Um, so it went down a little bit, but one day he just kept complaining of the headaches that he was experiencing. So he was prescribed um, Equagesac, which is actually aspirin with a tranquilizer. He actually had an allergic reaction to that and he passed away. So again, this is an unfair comparison, but again, why does this things occur? Why is it that some people who just eat the most unhealthiest things, they live the longest and people who eat healthy, you know, how does that happen? I'm gonna get into that in a second. So we all know that we need to invest in our health, right? I usually like to talk to people and say like, health and finances are pretty much tied together. Bad money habits over time is gonna lead to you not being able to retire early on. Bad eating habits over time is not, is not gonna reverse diabetes, high blood pressure and, and all these things, right? So me coming as a sports section, a good diet does not make an average athlete great, but a poor diet can make a great average, a great athlete average. This is from an exercise physiologist. So again, it really comes down to um, eating and then I'm gonna get into another important topic in a second. So again, why do some people who break the rules get away with it? Well, again, it comes down to genetics, luck, medical help. Obviously, if you can afford better quality of medicine versus people who can't, there's different things that, that can occur, right? So it all comes down to our health. So we all know nutritional health versus medical health. So conventional medicine is pretty much, think of it like a the fire department, right? When the fire department comes out and there's a fire, what are they doing? The hammer, the ax, their, um, the water, all that, right? When it comes to conventional medicine, what is the prescriptions that's prescribed? Well, drugs and surgery. In functional medicine, Functional medicine is pretty much like, well, what caused the fire to occur? So think of it like a carpenter, right? We got to find out what was wrong with the circuitry and then build the house from scratch. We got to find out what is causing all of this inflammation and disease in our body so that we don't have all these other problems in the future that gives us drugs and surgery, right? And so the problem is that as us as optometrists, we're taught about doing about the eyes, obviously, right? So when it thinks about everything else in the medical community, what are the what are we relying on? We're relying on all the primary care doctors, all the medical doctors to be worrying about these issues. But again, we're the ones that can actually see non-invasive things in the back of the eye before anybody else can. We have to be the ones actually implementing nutritional standpoints for our patients because the average student in medical school in the United States receives about 24 hours of nutrition training. If that's all the trainings they're getting, they're not going to be talking to their patients about this stuff. All right, and because they have different protocols than we do. So we always hear about inflammation all the time. Inflammation, 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 whether it's dry eye or whatever else disease it might be. The other component is oxidation. So what I want you to think of oxidation is like, if you were to have an apple and you took a bite into that apple well, and you left it on the table, what would happen? Well, it would actually start to turn colors, right? It would turn brown. Well, that's oxidation. So pretty much oxidation is rust happening inside your body. So things that you're eating is causing your body to rust over time, right? So remember, your body is like a sports car. We wanted to give it the best engine possible so that it runs the smoothest. Same concept here. So as I talked to you before, in the first two years of practice, I was actually in the office that saw the New York Giants. And it was actually Rashad Jennings. He was actually drafted in 2009 to the NFL. And then he got traded to the Giants later on. So when he was 16 years old in high school, he was on the football team. And he weighed 270 pounds. He was the fifth string on the bench. He would every day to practice to take a Dr. Pepper with him to the games and practice because he knew he would never play in a game. One day, the Tennessee scouts came to the game because they wanted to check out the top running back that the school had. Game starts. 
running backs playing in the game, the running back gets injured. They bring in the second string running back. Second running back gets injured. They bring the third one in. This is like a movie. Third one gets injured. They bring a fourth one in. The fourth one gets injured. They actually bring a wide receiver to play before he does. He also gets injured. They finally say, hey, Rashad, get in the game. Two plays later, he actually scores a touchdown, right? They put him on the bench. One of the guys were feeling better, the better players. Gets re-injured. Goes back into the game, gets another touchdown. So long story short, he actually got two touchdowns on offense and two touchdowns on defense. After the game, the Tennessee scout approaches Rashad and says, hey, you had a good game out there. What's your GPA? And he actually says 0.6. Right? He says, you got potential, but you got to get your grades up. Right? And so Rashad Jennings, you remember, he was a fifth string on the bench, overweight, had asthma, wears glasses. Right? Never knew he was going to play or anything like that. Now someone saw that he had potential in him. He's like, oh, my gosh, I got to start getting my, my act straight. If not, I'm not going to be able to get to the next level. So the reason why you see bread and, and milk and cheese and all the stuff that's on the screen is because he actually did a study on himself. So what he did was he actually put those ingredients, the bread, the milk, the cheese, and a burger, and he put it on a desk. And on the desk, what he did was he let it sit there for days and days and days. What happened was the bread, the milk, and the cheese all hardened after a few days, and the burger did not deteriorate. So why did it deteriorate? Because of the chemicals that are added into the foods that we're eating. And because of those chemicals, it's causing rust in our body. And now because of, of this experiment and all the things that he does, he now relies heavily on eating properly. So again, this is a picture of him when he was little on the left-hand side, a little chubby kid. And um, you're probably wondering, like a 270-pound kid, like what is he doing as a running back? Well, who's going to stop, I guess, a 270-pound kid in high school? Not many people, right? Um, so anyways, he says, eating is part of training. Often I do things that I'm not excited to do, but I know that it has an outcome that I'm chasing. So there was a study done in Purdue, and uh, it says – for high school students, like they gave them a survey of like, how properly do you think you're eating or how well do you think you're eating? And so out of the athletes, most majority of them gave themselves a B. The actual reality was that they actually had a D grade because of the food that's given in school, whatever food they might be bringing home to the actual lunchroom. So it just really depends, right? So a change is unlikely if a person sees no need for it because again, we have soda machines in the, in the schools, we have the snack machines, and we're eating unhealthy things constantly because it's put in front of us, and what else are we going to do? Because it's not nutritional things that are given to us. So physical hunger versus emotional hunger, right? So you always see those movies or commercials where you see like a girl who's sad or they got dumped or whatnot, and they're eating like a, bowl, a tub of ice cream, right? So again, there's different types of hunger, right? So whenever our body is craving a substance, let's say you're craving chocolate or you're craving an oily food, well, pretty much what you're, you're lacking is vitamins, minerals, and things of that nature. So instead of grabbing those types of ingredients, really what you should be, you should be picking is like for the chocolate, you really want some nuts, seeds, vegetables, and fruits, right? And then instead of uh, your, your oily foods, what you need is calcium, right? So Again, you're eating all these different things, right? So it really comes down to our health because food is our medicine. What we put in our body is gonna give us good or bad output in the, in the future. So again, I'm into sports. So um, GQ Magazine and Men's Health um, actually interviewed the top two um, in our sports in their fields, right? So Usain Bolt, fastest man alive, and then the best Olympian of all time, Michael Phelps. And this is the stuff that they tend to eat, right? Now, it doesn't mean that everybody should eat these things, but again, they're athletes. What do they do all constantly? They're training, they're sleeping, and training and sleeping and doing it over and over and over and over again, right? So they have to have a different amount of calories than a normal person would. But again, this is the stuff that they are typically eating um, when they're performing at their highest level. So every time I see a lecture, everybody talks about inflammation, but never, ever, ever, ever do I see anybody talk about sleep. Sleep is actually crucial, not only for our brain, for our entire bodies. Michael Phelps says, I really can't say it enough. I don't think people really pay enough attention to how important sleep is. If you look on the top, it says by a sports performance scientist, sleep is the most potent performance enhancing activity that we know of, right? On the right-hand side up here, optimal skill learning in athletes is, de is dependent on quality sleep within the first 24 hours after training because that is when the human brain learns. It's practice with sleep 
that makes perfect. And Sports Illustrated on the left says, more and more, sleep is being recognized as the most obvious, accessible, and natural performance enhancer in the NFL, the kind of secret weapon that players have always dreamed about. Now, in the NFL and other sports, they actually have sleep consultants. You might think that's crazy. They actually have sleep consultants training them on how, how to properly sleep. Because why? If you look on the left-hand side, everything is the positive performances that you get with sleep. On the right is all the things that happen if you don't get proper sleep. Watch this. On the right, all student athletes sleeping less than eight hours a day have about a 70% more likely to get injured. Whether that's a concussion or leg injury, whatever it is, they're getting injured because of lack of sleep, right? All sleep duration, strongest predictor of injury, not practice hours, number of sports played, strength training. It's the strongest predictor of injury, sleep duration. Well, how much sleep should we be getting? We should be getting between seven and nine hours a day, right? Look at this. Adults, 19 hours awake. You have a decrease in reaction time and eye-hand coordination similar to performance when well-rested but legally intoxicated. Sleep is the most crucial thing that we can do for our bodies because what happens when we're sleeping? Well, we're not, giving those, we're not getting those cravings to eat food because what happens when we start eating food? Well, type 2 diabetes starts to set in, our ghrelin and lectin levels start to increase, and we start to munch on things. The more sleep that we have, the better it is for our bodies to recover and also for our brains to enhance. Right. Um, just one thing on here. After sleep education, 100% of student athletes got more sleep and 89% experienced improved athletic performance. So any parents on this call, if you have any athletes or nieces or nephews and they're playing sports, the number one thing you could tell them is to get a proper adequate amount of sleep because it's crucial. So don't take my word for it because I'm just a sports guy. Let's go for Oxford study. They did a study on um, 362 students, uh, children who had sleeping issues, right? And so instead of not only sleeping, they added DHA. Remember what I told you, DHA is crucial because it's 60% of our brain. Result, children added 58 minutes of sleep per night to their sleep times and less waking episodes, right? Found that higher blood levels of DHA are significantly associated with better sleep, including less bedtime resistance, parasomnias, and sleep disturbances, right? Lower ratios of DHA have been linked with lower levels of melatonin, which plays an important role in sleep. And where did I tell you melatonin was found in? In your gut. So our gut relates to our brain and we need those key ingredients. So anytime we're looking at fish oils, which we're gonna get into in a little bit, I always tell in my lectures that you want a minimum, and you might think I'm crazy, you want a minimum of DHA of a thousand milligrams. If you look at bottles and you look over the counter, you're gonna see a, a thousand different types of, of of fish oils to buy. You want at least 1,000 milligrams of DHA. Now, if you really want to quell inflammation and minimize inflammation, you need about 3,000 milligrams. That's three grams. 3,000 milligrams is crucial. So minimum, you want 1,000. If you're getting under 1,000 and you're taking the fish oil, it's not really doing anything for you. And sometimes there's less quality. That's why you get the fish burp and all that stuff. So another study. Um, from the University of Pennsylvania, weekly fish consumption linked to better sleep and higher IQ, right? These are top two institutions that we know of. Um, another study on the gut microbiome. So actually, I didn't tell you in the beginning, but I actually have a master's degree in microbiology. So this is why I'm very interested and I'm also interested in sports, both of them tied together. So the gut microbiome diversity is associated with sleep physiology in humans, right? So I'm just trying to be funny here. So for those of you guys watch the, the Hardcore Palm Show, the humans need at least seven hours of sleep per night to function normally. Well, the best I can do is three hours because you have whatever jobs you have, how many kids you got to do. So I get it. Life is life is complicated. But in order for us to have the best form of success for our lives is to get enough sleep and also DHA supplement in our brains. So here we go. Even molecular psychiatry getting into the mix. Children with less sleep experience increased depression, anxiety, decreased cognitive performance. In our field, what is what are we worried about? Cognition, because we deal with the brain. The eye and the brains are connected, right? And so we see it all the time, increased depression, anxiety. Why are these things occurring? Well, there's different um, foods that they're eating, medicines that they might be on, lack of sleep, stressed out. There's a whole list. It continues on and on. So DHA, again, is very, very important. It's actually found in all gray matter of our brain and inside in our retina, right? And so you always hear about your um, pro-inflammatories and anti-inflammatories. So your omega-3s is your anti-inflammatory and your omega-6s is your pro-inflammatories. Your pro 
but we still need a rocketonic acid in our bodies. You actually, you know how they say you want omega-3s? Yes, you do want omega-3s, but you need a ratio of four to one when it comes to omega-6 to omega-3s. For, for those of you who don't know, olive oil is actually an omega-9, all right? So DHA deficiency can impair vision, especially in children, dry eye syndrome, right? Low levels of DHA and EPA are associated with retinal eye diseases, right? So we're in the eye field business, right? We need to be educating our patients about DHA consumption. What is the biggest um, debate in the eye care field? Does um, omega-3s help with dry eye? Again, it's in our brain. So really we should be focusing on what protects our brain and our, and our cognition versus what's happening with our dryness. But I'll go back to this because there's a lot of dry eye experts on this call probably. When you have DHA, they both convert into prostaglandins. Prostaglandin one actually helps with our tears. That's why the fish oils and fish, the consumption that you're taking actually helps with your tears. DHA is very, very crucial because again, it's 60% of your brain. And the reason why I keep um, repeating myself is because it takes at least seven times for someone to say something for someone to actually stick in your brain, right? So it's very, very important. So the take home message of this entire lecture is you want at least DHA minimum of a thousand because it's gonna protect your brain. So here we go. DHA and arachidonic acid nutrition and early development. Human breast milk actually provides DHA and arachidonic acid. That's why it's a thousand times better to actually breastfeed than actually give someone formula milk when they're born. Now, there, there are some places or reasons why uh, uh, somebody cannot breastfeed. That's understandable. But if you have the ability to breastfeed, that is 1000% the best option that you can possibly provide to your child. So hopefully I make you a little bit hungry here. Usually I'll ask the audience, like what type of uh, fish would you prefer? So I'll say, which one do you pick, sockeye or, or king? Which one is better? You know, and, and I'll get half and half raised in the room, right? And for the vegetarians, I'm not picking any. But so I did my own study. So I went to Whole Foods. And when I went to Whole Foods, I was looking at the different prices of fish. And so if you look over here, it says Atlantic salmon, farm raised. I should have taken a picture of the, of the wild caught because wild caught is always cost more than farm raised. The reason being is because when you have farm raised fish, when they collect the fish, they actually have them in like a net and they're given, they're given food that they're not normally supposed to be eating, let's say corn and stuff like that. And so wild caught means that they're in their natural environment eating the things that they're supposed to be eating. So that's why whenever you look at farm raised and wild caught fish, wild caught always costs more because of that. It's the healthier option. So look, if you look at sockeye salmon here and king, you'll notice there's a huge difference in price. So you're like, why is it that king salmon costs more than sockeye besides the name that it has king in it, you know? And so whether you giggled or not at that, the reason why king salmon costs more is because what's the topic about? Well, DHA. A king salmon has way more DHA than any fish in the ocean, right? Coming in second place is your herring, and then you got black cod, sockeye coming in fourth, and then you got your regular salmons over here. So the reason why even the American Heart Association recommends that we be eating uh, fish twice a day. Why? Because it helps with our brain and our skin and different things in our bodies. So I'm gonna focus more on the, the micronutrients, but a quick recap on micronutrients. Obviously we know about water, carbs, proteins, and fats, right? So when it comes to fats, we're always saying like, you know, we definitely don't want polyunsaturated, monosaturated, and trans fats, you know, monosodium glutamate, we don't want any of those things. But we actually do want healthy saturated fats. Healthy saturated fats is like grass-fed meats or grass-fed butter or ghee and things of that nature. That actually helps protect because remember, what is our brain made of? Fat, we need good quality saturated fat. And that's where DHA comes into play. So again, um, our brain and our visual systems are linked as we know. The biggest component, again, why do athletes always look amazing? Because well, they're getting proper sleep and what else are they doing? They're also exercising a lot. Whenever you're doing aerobic exercise, that is actually helping your brain from damage because it's repairing your damaged cells and giving new ones. So. Adults, as adults, we should be doing at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week of exercise. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym and do these exercises. Exercise could mean you walk around the block a few times or you get on a bike or something like that. Or maybe while you're brushing your teeth, you're doing um, up and down movements, you know, or you might do jumping jacks. I'm just giving you different examples, right? So the reason why aerobic exercise is important is because it boosts your hippocampus. That's the important region that gives us our memory and our learning. And also it lowers the risk of developing Alzheimer's and dementia. Well, what is the whole reason of protecting our brain? It's so that we don't have cognitive decline in the future. 
right? And so that's why aerobics, exercise, and DHA are crucial for our bodies. So I thought this was a cute little cartoon. Uh, we always see how the walnut kind of looks like the brain and how the, um, the carrot kind of resembles the eye. So as we know, most of our patients, when they come into the, into the exam room, if let's say they didn't change in their prescription or they're doing well visually or whatnot, they'll be like, oh, they'll make a joke and say, oh, I've been eating my carrots. Technically, carrots is not the number one eye ingredient. So normally I would ask the audience, what is the number one eye or what is it the number one vegetable for the eye? Half of the room are going to say spinach. The other half of the room is actually going to say kale, right? The number one green leafy vegetable or vegetable for that matter is actually kale. Spinach, I'm going to shock your minds right now. Spinach is actually third. Coming in second is actually collard greens, right? And the reason why is because I'm going to get into it is because of the lutein and zeaxanthin factors that it has in it. So now we're going to talk about macular pigment. I talked about the brain with DHA. Now we got to talk about the macular pigment. The macular pigment, those carotenoids inside of our macula are very, very important. We always hear about lutein and zeaxanthin, but the problem is, is that we leave out the most important one, mesozeaxanthin. That's actually very crucial. Why? Because it actually has the highest antioxidant component in the macula, right? Now, we're eye care specialists, right? What is our job? Our job is to protect our patients to get them to see the best. We need to be also talking to our patients about their macular pigment. Why? Because if you look here, macular pigment not only helps vision, it enhances vision. Do we not want our patients to have better vision than they have? Of course we do, right? And in a sports arena, when it comes to seeing, right, it's not just about our visual acuity, it's about other things, your peripheral awareness, contrast sensitivity, right? You're able to see through glare if you're trying to catch up a pop-up fly in baseball. Contrast sensitivity is crucial because why? With contrast sensitivity, that means greens are greener, reds are redder, and things of that nature. Macular pigment is the only thing that can enhance our visual acuity. So as optometrists, we're kind of like nearsighted where in the fact that when we talk about macular, all we really focus on is macular degeneration. I want you to pretend that macular degeneration does not exist for a moment. Just imagine that it does not exist. Macular pigment actually helps with many different things besides macular degeneration, right? And I'm going to get into that. The problem is that the majority of the population gets only one to two milligrams of lutein from the diet alone. Remember, that's green leafy vegetables and things like that. We all know the study suggests 10 to 2, right? So if we're not supplementing with any carotenoids, especially mesozeaxanthin, our brains are not getting the full effect and our vision is not getting the full effect that we need. So a quick history lesson. So back in the 1800s, this guy named Max, he was actually the first person to discover that um, blue light was absorbed with the macular pigments. Then in 1945, George Walt, he was actually um, a Harvard professor. He won the Nobel Prize, and he was the one that discovered that vitamin A was the component of the retina. In 1985, that's when the macular pigment was consisted of lutein and zeaxanthin, right? They're trying to figure all these things out. In 1988, three years later, they confirmed that it was the macular pigment consisted of those things. And in 1995 is when the actual classification and grading system for AMD actually started. So in 1995, we actually had a baseline of like, how do we determine with macular degeneration? So here we go. So remember I was telling you about how important lutein and zeaxanthin is, right? Because why? 78% of our population is at risk because we already know that they're getting less than two milligrams of the components that we need, right? So again, here's the different um, ingredients of how much each of these things have. That's why it's very, very important. So look, remember kale, number one, then we got collard greens, number two, right? And where did this thing come from? This actual diagram come from? Well, it actually came from the carotenoid database for U.S. foods, right? And so, again, these things are very, very, very important. Because why? Because zeaxanthin actually accumulates in three areas of our body. It's in our skin, it's in our brain, but most importantly, it's in our eyes. Again, we're eye care professionals. The concentration of zeaxanthin in our eyes is a thousand times stronger. So what does that mean for the eyes and the brain? Well, the connection is now speeded up quicker. So when you're playing a sport, your reaction time has improved dramatically. In sports, split-second decision-making is crucial, right? In my chair, every single patient that I have is an athlete, whether they're a five-year-old or they're a 90-year-old, right? Because why? 
does not and most people that we see drive, especially at nighttime, driving is considered a sport in a way because you have three, four, five lanes, right? If you're speeding up that reaction time, we're going to have less accidents happening and just better overall quality of vision and better life. So in, in 2015, Sports Illustrated came out with their Amer oh, well, uh, American Pharoah was the racehorse. He actually won the race. And so uh, Sports Illustrated actually put a nice little blurb here on uh, how important carotenoids are and how important zeaxanthin and lutein. So again, I, I'm just a sports guy, but let's look at other experts in the field. So I know it's hard to see, but I'm going to read it here. It says most teams use zeaxanthin in supplement form. Ray's assistant athletic trainer, that's the Tampa Rays for baseball, the athletic trainer keeps it next to the multivitamins and fish oil. Not only is he taking multivitamins and a fish oil, he's taking zeaxanthin, which is available at health and nutrition stores, right? Then he talks about the different ones. So zeaxanthin is actually derived from the chili pepper and all these things. These are actually very important ingredients that we need. So remember, if you go back to the history lesson, what did we learn? That the classification started in 1995. Well, the AMD Foundation over here um, saying that lutein for preventing macular degeneration, right? But in Harvard, this study came out in 1994 before the classification before the classification even came out. They said that six milligrams per day of lutein led to 43% lower risk of AMD. Now the recommended dosage is six milligrams to 30 milligrams. We already know that 10 to two ratio, right? And if you smoke, you need to be having 10 milligrams. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, we, they don't want to have beta carotene. And you're right. That's why we don't want to give them beta carotene because we don't want to uh, cause more lung cancer for them. So if we see these recommended dosages and most patients are only getting one to two milligrams at best, we need to be talking to our patients and educating about the nutritional uh, supplements that are out there, right? So now think of this logically when you're um, you know, your patient in your chair. If you have somebody who smokes, let's say they smoke a pack a day, right? And obviously they know it's bad for them to smoke and you tell your patients to stop smoking. It's like beating a dead horse, right? Do you think they're gonna listen to you because you told them to stop smoking? No, right? So let's just say they smoke 20 cigarettes a day. How about have a conversation with them and say, can we do 18 a day? You're like, in your mind, be like, well, what's two cigarettes less? Well, it's a habit that they gotta form. They gotta create that habit. They're not just gonna go cold turkey and stop smoking. It takes time for that to occur. So let's go to 18. Okay, we got to 18. Can we go to maybe 15 now? I'll try, right? You got to be real with patients because they're not going to just do something out of the blue just because you told them. They got to have a reason why. So the ARED study, we all know the ARED study. I'm not going to bore you on the ARED study because you know about the ARED study. We know about the vitamins and the minerals and all the stuff that's in it, right? But what I want you to focus on is on the next one, is the Beaver, uh, the Beaver Dam study. So this is a 15-year cumulative study. There's about 4,000 4, patients, about 39, 4,000 patients in it. And so what they did was they were measuring between the um, ages of 43 to 54 years old and also people older than 75. So a person or a patient that was older than 75 years old at baseline with no issues, they had larger drusen compared to people in their 40s and 50s. So the left-hand side is 24 and 18 and 20 and 4. Those are people at 74. The ones over here, 10 and six and three, those are people in their 40s and their 50s. So if they're people in their 40s and their 50s getting this percentages of large drusen, industry drusen, right, retinal pigment abnormalities, we need to have to be in the front lines to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. The only way that we could do that is number one, eating healthy, number two, DHA, number three is macular pigments because it helps protect our macula. The macula is 2% of the entire retina, the macula, I'll say it again, the macula is 2% of the entire retina, but when it is affected, it is the number one cause of blindness. I will say it one more time. The macula is 2% of the entire retina, and when it is affected, it is the number one leading cause of blindness. As eye care professionals, we need to be talking to our patients about the nutritional side of things. So here's another study. Um, so this one is on early for patients who had early age-related macular degeneration. There are three different groups. So lutein was 20 and zeaxanthin was less than one. Then we had our normal mesozeaxanthin, lutein and zeaxanthin at 10, 10, 2, and a higher dosage of mesozeaxanthin in last year. So long story short, between two and three years, significant increases in macular pigment in both of these groups. 
but nothing improved in group one. So remember in that in the before I said lutein was very good. So this is a high dosage of lutein. Well, had no effect in your macular pigment increasing. Group two and three actually increased. Now you're probably thinking two, three years, that's a long time. Do you think my patients are gonna wait two, three years? Well, think of this logically as an athlete. Do you think the athletes got there in two, three years? It took them long years of training to get to the highest level. It takes a long time for you to start a habit so that you create that habit and it doesn't go and you, you create good habits, right? You have to set it in for your patients that this is the, the trend that we got to go into if you want to live a healthy and successful life. Now, contrast sensitivity significantly improved in group two beyond 24 months. So it's beyond two years in group two, which is mesozeaxanthin of 10, lutein of 10, and two, but not in group one and three. AMD, none progressed to the advanced AMD over the three-year study with group two. And what is group two? Well, not only just lutein and zeaxanthin, it also had mesozeaxanthin in it. Mesozeaxanthin is crucial. So if you're taking like an AREDS formula with no mesozeaxanthin or any other type of AREDS formula that has no mesozeaxanthin, you're not getting the best effect for your macular pigment. Now, this one before was on early age-related macular degeneration. This one is people who are free of retinal disease, no macular degeneration. In this study, this one showed the formula of 1010 actually improved or enhanced contrast sensitivity. Again, what is contrast sensitivity for? Well, when you're driving, playing sports. Again, I'm a sports person. That's crucial, right? Now, don't take my word for it. Even the US Air Force is getting into the mix. The actual US Air Force had this study here, macular pigment and visual performance in glare, the benefits of photo stress recovery, disability glare, and visual discomfort. Again, well, we're pilots, right? We can't have visual issues when you're in the air, right? Same thing when we're driving. It's very, very important, our macular pigment. This is another study here. Um, so the reason why I'm, I'm just loading you with studies is because it's not my word for it. It's I'm showing you all the studies that show you all these things. So the effects of macular xanthophil supplementation on brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So BDNF, that is actually very crucial in our brain. It's actually protects our brain and our spinal cord and those, it protects the cells of our, of, our, of our brain and our spinal cord. A Harvard professor actually said that um, BDNF is actually like miracle growth for the brain, right? Because it protects our brain and minimizes cognitive performance. Again, what did I tell you about mesozeaxanthin? It maintains the highest antioxidant capacity. So what is antioxidants for? Antioxidants helps minimize the rust that happens inside our body, right? So very, very important to increase our brain-derived neurotrophic factor. How do we do that? Well, there's, there's supplements for that, but also blueberries helps with that. Dark chocolate, especially if it's 70% cacao or higher. Um, extra virgin olive oil. That's why you want to be like dousing some extra virgin olive oil on foods that you're eating. Let's say you have an avocado, douse some olive oil on that to get more good fat in your body. Because why? It, incre it increases your brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, this is a study here that actually measures all many different companies of what they actually have, the amounts that they, they, they claim they have when it comes to zeaxanthin, lutein, or mesozeaxanthin. So it's a pretty cool study here. And so as you can see on the left, there's a bunch of different companies. So we got Preservision, we got Fluoroglow, lutein here, I Promise Restore, Zeavision is I Promise, if you don't know that, uh, Macu Health, Macu Shield. So Macu Shield, um, in a, from not in the United States, different countries. So I got Europe here, we got Occupied. Anyways, so what we're looking at is we're looking at what they're declaring over here. So where it says LZ, so they're, so let's say Preservision, AREDS, they're declaring that they have five milligrams of lutein in their capsules. And so when they actually measured it, so they actually a little bit more. So preservation is actually saying it has a little bit more, okay? But now we're gonna look at the, the zeaxanthin levels. Let's say, for example, uh, zeavision right here for eye problems. Zeavision or zeaxanthin, they're saying they have eight milligrams of zeaxanthin. That's what they claim. In their actual testing, it actually had about 1.3. So what we're actually, ingesting in our bodies is not really there because they're declaring it, but not actually having it measured properly, right? So me in sports, right? There's two eye vitamins that actually help with sports, right? There's one is Vision Edge and then another one is called Visual Edge Pro, two different companies, right? So 
But if, if one company is declaring one and, and not testing for that appropriate amount, so let's say, for example, Macchia Health, looting here with 10, right on par where it needs to be, right? So there's different things. Now, another thing I want you to focus on is mesozeaxanthin because a lot of people don't really tout or promote mesozeaxanthin. So for example, mesozeaxanthin and fluoroglolutein, this says they have none. But when they measured it, there's actually some mesozeaxanthin in it, right? And then let's see another one. Uh, Macnivision Europe, mesozeaxanthin. Uh, so IOSA, -I mesozeaxanthin 10. This one actually had more mesozeaxanthin. So good kudos to IOSA, right? So I just wanted to show you that there was a study that is declaring and, and what it actually has can be crucial for our bodies. Now, when you're taking a supplement, they have to be actually free of banned substances. So they're NSF certified. So what does that mean? That they're approved to be utilized in NCAA, the professional sports, right? So these substances are NSF certified when you purchase these. So another study on the impact of uh, lutein zeaxanthin, right? And so if you noticed here that there's five groups, group one, 10, 10, two in one capsule. Group two had 10, 10, two in two capsules. 10, 10, two with DHA and EPA in two capsules. The other one is 10, 10, two, but in a micro micelle formulation. And the other one was a placebo, right? And so what it came down to was that in the micro micelle formulation, when it has that formula inside of it, when you actually ingest it, it absorbs appropriately in your system, in your gut, right? So the result was that lutein increased by 200% in the AREDS2 study and by 304% in the CREST AMD study. Group four of carotenoids exhibited the largest response of absorption of zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin compared to all these other groups. Because of why? Because of that micro micelle formulation that it has. So again, more studies in the best uh, ophthalmology visual sciences, macular pigment and visual performance in low light conditions. Again, now we're talking about cognitive decline. So macular carotenoids, remember I said, I want you to forget about AMD for a second because why do macular carotenoids are important? Well, it helps to minimize cognitive decline. And so an impact on Alzheimer's disease. Supplemental retinal carotenoids enhance memory in healthy individuals. This is not disease individuals, in healthy individuals with low levels of macular pigment. That's why supplementing with carotenoids is crucial for our brains. Another study, supplementation with carotenoids reduces stress, serum cortisol, and suboptimal symptoms of physical and emotional health in young adults, right? So the biggest takeaway, DHA, macular carotenoids, sleep. Now, another study on macular carotenoid supplementation improves visual performance, sleep quality, adverse physical symptoms, and those with high screen exposure. So obviously with the pandemic, and obviously right now we're doing virtual learning, right? So our screen time exposure has increased dramatically. Now in the, in the science, there's back and forth with blue lights and especially with the lenses and all that stuff. But you remember our blue light, our internal sunglasses is our macular pigment, right? Very, very important. Now, when you're supplementing with macular pigments, you're probably maybe wondering if there's any side effects to, can you have an overdose on macular pigments? So doses of 20 milligrams for up to six months were not associated with any side effects. And even doses of 30 milligrams for five months or over two months were not associated with any side effects. The only known side effect when actually you overdose on a carotenoid is pretty much you look like Trump. So pretty much your skin turns orange. And then if you stop taking it, you go back to normal. All right. Now, there's ways to test your macular pigments. So this is one. Obviously, we have your, your M-Pod to help to check the back to make sure that we'll, what's there, right? And so we already know that 78% 70, uh, of the population is lacking those crucial carotenoids, right? And so that blue light is absorbing and causing retinal conditions, right? We need to be make sure that we're on the right-hand side, right? So remember, I told you carotenoid is not only located in the brain and the eyes, but it's also located in our skin. So they actually came out with a device that actually checks the carotenoid levels of your skin, right? And so the device is a biophotonic scanner. And so you just place your palm on it and it reads the amount of carotenoids that you have, right? And so I found this kind of interesting. Remember dietary habits and lifestyle choices and everything like that. So 
you're more in the red if you have a low intake of fruits and vegetables, in regular or no supplementation, high stress, right? BMI, all that stuff. Moderate intake. So pretty much the people who are healthy is above average intake of fruits and vegetables, low stress. This one was kind of interesting. Infrequent air travel. So being in an, in an airplane many times over and over, especially for a lot of speakers that travel over the place, occasional air travel can actually lower your carotenoid levels. Now, there's a device out there that can actually test for AMD. So think of this as like the um, doing a visual field for glaucoma. But now this is actually doing a test for AMD. So the the owner or the, the creator of the device is Dr. Jackson, Greg Jackson, who I took a picture and got to meet with. That's what you see in the photo there. Um, but this is actually a device that can help detect um, early AMD. Now, do we need the device? Probably not if we're educating our patients about eating right and all that stuff, but it takes the whole tribe to get everybody to start doing everything, right? So now, this was actually in the new retinal physician. This is in the ophthalmology magazines. So they asked a survey to their ophthalmologists. And so it says, at what point in the disease progression do you suggest a patient taking a supplement, right? And so 36% said when they have early AMD, 77% said intermediate AMD, and 42% when they have late AMD. Now think of this logically, right? Do you start treating glaucoma when they're full-blown glaucoma or right before they're gonna have some problems? I would hope you say before they have start to have some problems, right? So you wanna be more proactive instead of reactive because we wanna make sure that our brain does not deteriorate or our macular doesn't start to get worse over time, right? Now look at this. What reasons do patients give for non-compliance? Well, obviously, you know, it could be because of cost or the pills are too big or things like that, right? Um, too many medications, well, that's another problem. Um, do you believe it is ethical? If they're asking the ophthalmologist, do you believe it is ethical for healthcare providers to sell supplements in their office? So it's a half and half even split. Even though half of them say it's ethical for them to do it, only 20% of them sell it, right? Now, again, they're, they're um, retina specialists and they're, they make their money doing surgeries, right? So do they really wanna prevent something where they make their money on doing surgery. So it's like a catch 22 in a way, but they even said it's ethical for them to be selling it, right? Now we're, we're talking about green leafy vegetables and omegas, right? So when a patient is taking like a, a blood thinner, like Coumadin, Warfarin or anything like that, right? So many people will say, you don't wanna start eating green leafy vegetables. Well, that was the old way of thinking. Now there's new studies showing that at least you don't have to overdose on green leafy vegetables, but that you can actually take it in moderation that actually helps. So here on, on this study from JAMA, patients had been advised had been advised to avoid vitamin K rich foods so as to not counteract warfarin defects. Although clinical guidance now recommends consistent intake instead, right? Because again, green leafy vegetables help with our zeaxanthin lutein in our brain, right? Now omega threes, right? This is actually from the Journal of Neurotrauma. The overall clinical data suggests that DHA at doses up to six grams, up to six, that's a heavy dosage, that's 6,000 milligrams, does not have de deleterious effects on platelet aggregation or other clotting parameters in normal individuals, and fish oil does not augment aspirin-induced inhibition of blood clotting, right? Remember what I told you, you want a minimum of 1,000. To minimize inflammation, you want at least three, right? And this one is saying that up to six does not have any effects, right? I'm not saying that you should be on the high dose of four or five, I'm saying between at least one to three, right? And again, this is for people who have suffered from traumatic brain injury, so concussions and things like that. That's why they're given high dosage because they got to repair the brain because our brain is made up of what? 60% of fat. So now we're going to talk about the micronutrients. I think we got about uh, 50 minutes left. So we always talk about drugs, but rarely do we ever talk about vitamins, right? So the ones in red are fat-soluble vitamins, right? So that means they stored late, they're stored more in our fatty parts of our body and also in our liver. Vitamin B and C, even though they're very crucial, when we ingest them, it actually gets excreted in our body within hours. That's why we have to constantly be taking vitamin B and C. Now, the reason why the ones in green over here are the minerals, even though these are all very important minerals, when it comes to athletes, calcium, iron, and zinc are the three most important, okay? Now, these are the recommended allowances, and this is from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. This is the recommended dosages of vitamins. And look, also lutein, zeaxanthin, zinc, and copper, right? And then we all know about our healthy diet. And remember, I was telling you about saturated fat. We actually do want saturated fat because why? It helps with our brain, okay? 
So I'm going to go quick with the vitamins because I just want to show you with the vitamins how it affects our eyes because vitamins do many different things for our bodies, but we're eye care professionals. I want to talk to you about the eyes. We all know that vitamin A is, helps with our retina, right? Beta carotene can convert to retinol and all that stuff, right? It's stored in our liver, but 10% is actually found in our retina, right? So, and look, you can see kale and spinach are actually very good for vitamin A. If you have a deficiency in vitamin A, it can lead to night blindness, chalazians, dry eyes. Those are the three main factors, right? So this is a good amount of eye use to take for all eye conditions and supports the retina. Now watch, there was actually a study that just recently came out and I believe, was it just 2022? Yeah, in February of 2022, optometry and vision science. We demonstrate the clinical correlation between vitamin A level with chalazia in East Chinese children. Vitamin A deficiency is likely to be a potential cause of childhood chalazia. Now we always think chalazia in their kids, all oh, the bacteria, they're rubbing their, no, it's actually because they're lacking vitamin A, right? And it's one of these studies are showing and it also causes night blindness as we showed. Vitamin B. Vitamin B is very, 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 very crucial. So I want you to remember this. B, vitamin B, helps to protect your brain cells. Vitamin B, brain. I'll say it again. Vitamin B, brain. Now, for any ladies on the, on the call, if you have ever taken a, um, a birth control, whether you're on it or you've taken it before, whenever you're on a birth control pill, your B vitamins are being depleted. Also, if you're on a sulfur drug, your B vitamins are being depleted. So B vitamins is known as the stress vitamin. We should all be on a B complex, not just an individualized B. So let's say a B6 or B12, you want an entire B complex because remember vitamin B gets excreted out of our body. We need to be constantly taking vitamin B, okay? So we're gonna break it down now. So we got vitamin B1, which is thiamine, right? And so, well, what does it help with? Well, it helps with our circulation, right? But it also helps with cognitive and brain function. What do we see with our brain? Vitamin B is crucial. If you're deficient in vitamin B1, it can lead to optic neuritis. You're like, what? Well, here's a study. Thiamine deficient optic neuropathy associated with Wernicke's encephalopathy in patients with chronic diarrhea, right? And why are people getting diarrhea? Because their guts are all messed up, right? And so we need to be incorporating healthy eating and also certain types of vitamins. Now we got riboflavin. We all know riboflavin for what? Riboflavin because of collagen cross-linking, right? But if you are, are deficient, and it's the most common deficiency when it comes to vitamins, when it comes to the eyes, you have bloodshot eyes, itching, burning, cataracts, and light sensitivity, right? So very important to be supplementing, not just with an individual B, with a B complex. Now we're on niacin, B3. Now this one, if you take too much, of B3, or if you're taking too much food that has B3, it can actually cause cystoid macular edema. And so look, ocular effects of niacin, a review of the literature and ophthalmology can cause some of these things to occur. So again, we really don't talk about vitamins. I wanna show you how the vitamins interact with our eyes. Now I got B5. So nothing really with the eyes in B5, but just know it helps with our adrenal glands. So as you can see, and you guys have the handout, so you can see all the recommended daily allowances. So I'm not going to go through each one because we'll be here forever. Um, next is B6. Now, this one's, this one's interesting. When I have a patient and I ask them, because we always ask our patients what medicines they're on, but do we ever ask our patients, and hopefully you do, what vitamins you're on? Well, now, if you don't, we'll start doing that now. So when a patient says, yeah, I'm on B, okay, what kind of B? And they're like, I'm taking a B12. In my mind, I don't say this, and I'm like, why are you on a B12? The reason why I'm saying that in my mind is because you need B6 in order to properly absorb B12. So if you're just taking B12, just take B12, it's not really absorbed in your body properly, you're just taking it to take it and you're just wasting money. So you need B6 to take B12. If you see any like type of energy drink or drinks in that matter, they always have B6 and 12 together. So if you're just on a B12, you're not doing anything. Now, if you're deficient on B6, it can actually cause central serous, right? And who are the people that get central serous? Well, the people who are stressed out all the time. And what do people have when they're stressed out? Lack of sleep, their guts are all messed up. It all ties together. Next level or is biotin. We all know about hair, skin, and nails when it comes to vitamin B7. So this one was interesting. Nothing really traumatic with the eyes, but I saw this one study here. Biotin decreases retinal apoptosis and induces eye malformations in the early chick, chick embryo. So, but again, biotin is really good for our hair, nails, and skin. Next is B9, folic acid. 
Folic acid is actually very, very, very important for people who are, are pregnant um, and for fetal development in children. Um, so this is why it's very important for, that's why when you go to the OBGYN and you're pregnant, they're giving you folic acid, okay? Next is B12. Remember, I already told you B12, you need B6 to properly absorb it, right? And so if you have um, about 10 to 15% of adults actually have this deficiency where it increases your risk of dry AMD to progress to wet AMD. The crazy thing is that this is the biggest risk factor for dementia and depression, right? When it comes to B12. And where do we get B12? Actually, one of the top things for B12 when you take, when you eat something is actually sardines. Sardines is very, very loaded. It's actually known as a superfood um, for sardines. So just know that you're, if you have that, the hyperhomocysteinemia, you have an increased risk of dry AMD progression to wet AMD. And so how do we figure out if we're high or low in all these levels, right? Well, we got to test them, obviously. So we're going to get into that in a little bit. Vitamin C. Remember I told you vitamin B and C also deplete from our bodies very, very quickly. So we need these in our body constantly. And when it comes to our eyes, well, what does it do? It helps fortify our flare and our cataracts. Our lens, you know, when we, when we were in school or when I was in school, they taught you if you were to take a bite out of your lens, you would actually have vitamin C in your body. Because why? Because you have 20 times more vitamin C than your plasma. The number one eye-related structure that has vitamin C is actually our aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is flooded with vitamin C, right? And so we all know where we can get vitamin C from. And, but it's, it's immunity, right? Because it helps us with our common colds, right? And all that stuff. And so very, very important. Vitamin D. If I had to pick any two vitamins for anybody, I would be B and D hands down. By far the top two. The reason why, whenever we see vitamin D and the deficiency, when we're taking boards and all that, we will always remember rickets, right? The board disorder. But for adults, we can also get osteomalacia, right? Now, for the eyes, when it comes to vitamin D, it can cause, well, you know, the studies with myopia control or, or all that, keratoconus, pink eye, cataracts, dry eye, AMD, D, uh, di diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, retinoblastoma, uveitis. Now, watch this. All three of these, the cornea endothelium, the ganglion cell layer, and the retinal photoreceptors all have vitamin D receptors. So again, we're eye care professionals. We need to be talking to our patients about these things because why? When it comes to vitamin D, I would say about 70 to 80% of the population is vitamin D deficient. And why? Well, especially with the pandemic, we weren't outdoors a lot. Now we're starting to get outdoors more and all that stuff, right? But watch this right here. It's best utilized by the body if you're taking it with vitamin A. Right. So remember, a top two out of pick B and D. But again, with D, you need it's best utilized if you have it with A. They're all important, but if I had to pick two, I'm picking B and D. Okay. Now, again, with the Giants, remember. So they did a study on the Giants for vitamin D deficiency. These are athletes. If you have a deficiency, is leading you to depression, decreased energy levels, cognitive impairment. Remember, this whole lecture is about our brain, right? Okay. Studies show that 60% of American children have insufficient levels of vitamin D. So normal levels of vitamin D is between any, anywhere between 30 and 50 nanograms per milliliter, right? So really we want about 40, let's just say. So they tested 90 other players in 2010. 27 of them had deficient levels less than 20. 45 of them had insufficient levels. 18 of them were normal. And as you notice, the white players versus the African-American players had a higher dosage. So if you're African-American and dark pigmented skin, you actually get lower levels of vitamin D, all right? So that's why supplementation is very important. And what also is important? Well, they're athletes. What happens? They get muscle injury, especially in football. Well, the average is 19.9. They need, and you're, and you're thinking, well, they're outdoors. Yeah, they're outdoors still, but they still need the supplement to maintain their optimal levels to help them. Now, for people who have, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, or cystic fibrosis, you cannot properly absorb vitamin D. So if any of you guys have that or any of your patients have that, your body's not absorbing vitamin D properly. So very, very important. Vitamin E, very, uh, an antioxidant, as we all know. Um, for the eyes, uh, strabismus, nearsightedness, cataracts, and AMD. So that's why you see um, on your uh, supplements when it comes to the carotenoids, you'll see that the alpha tocopherol, that's your vitamin E because it helps with the AMD portion of it. Okay. Now, if you're a vegan or vegetarian and you're not, you're not eating meats or anything like that, well, sadly, 
you're usually deficient in these in these nutrients, vitamin B12, D, calcium, iodine, iron, zinc. And the most important that I care about, again, is EPA and DHA. All of those, those seven things that you see on the screen are all needed for brain recovery, repair, and optimization. So you might be thinking, well, what, what do they do if they're vegan? Well, they'll eat more nuts or seeds or things like that, but they could also um, take algae oil, which will help with their DHA, DHA and EPA levels. Very, very important. Zinc. Now, um, there's different formulations with higher or lower levels of zinc, but zinc uh, for the eyes can lead to cataracts and night blindness. So you want zinc in our bodies. Actually, zinc is very important when it comes to our guts because it actually helps with our gut lining. So zinc is actually very important, but just remember not to exceed more than 40 milligrams, okay? Now, remember I told you, well, how do we know what kind of levels that we have? We always test patients for other different things, but we never talk about vitamins. Why? Because no one ever talks to us about it. Not talk to us in schools, right? So you can actually get vitamin testing. Now I'm in the state of New Jersey. All of these states for LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics, you cannot order these testings if you live in any of these states. I don't know why, it's just the law, right? We're, we're a um, legislative profession, well, there's laws in this, okay? So if you don't la live in any of these states, you have access to this. So there's something called walk-in labs. You can actually look in many different tests, whether it's cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, you can order these tests, right? So, for example, electrolytes. Well, when you're an athlete, you're losing electrolytes, right? Your potassium, minerals, all that stuff, right? So this is actually checking for kidney problems, acids in your blood. Well, you can order these things and it tells you when you're going to get your results and all that stuff. Well, I guess you would go with Quest because it costs $5 cheaper, right? But um, you can get both of these um, done through there. So here's the description. So the electrolyte panel is used to identify an electrolyte, fluid, or pH imbalance in the blood, right? And if you're properly in balance, well, what's going to happen? You're going to be confused. You're going to be weak. Fluid accumulation, you'll have edema and all these things, right? So we always rush to medicines, but we don't think about the other important parts of our body. Those vitamins and minerals are very, very, very um, crucial when it comes to that. So vitamins. Now, remember I gave you the whole synopsis on vitamins? Well, there's a vitamin blood test panel. That's A, B, 6, 9, 12, C, D, E, and potassium. Right. And so what's high in potassium? Green leafy vegetables also. So again, fast, you got you to fast for 12 hours is required. Refrain from taking these vitamins. It tells you what to do and you'll get your results in seven to 10 days. Um, so these are not cheap and they're not covered by insurance. Right. So, you know, obviously the people who are who have more money are the healthier ones. Well, the people who can afford to get these tests, then you might be thinking, my patients are not going to buy these things. But if you don't tell them about them, they'll never know about it and they'll never know them and see if they want to get better or not. So the job is to educate us so that we tell our patients that there's things out there that can help us determine if we're deficient on certain levels so that we, our bodies can get rejuvenated, right? It's not it's not cheap, but if, if they have problems and they're never getting um, taken care of, they're not going to be on this planet for a very long time. So vitamin deficiency, another different test you could do. A wellness blood test panel, right? So now this is the one that we normally as doctors would tend to get, right? We're always checking CRP levels, the creatinine levels, all that stuff, right? So when you go into, um, you get this test done and the patient comes back with the results or they fax it to you, you're usually gonna see something like this, right? And so we all know how to read these things or look at them and look at the abnormal levels and everything like that. and we determine these things and, and want to find these things out. So we want to know what's going on in your blood or what's causing the inflammation to happen. Well, technically, we should already know the inflammation is already happening in our gut and the things that we're eating, right? And it's throwing everything out of whack, right? So we got to really be implementing and talking to our patients about the nutrition side of things. Now, for me, again, I'm an athlete, right? So here's the athletic. There's an athlete, athlete metric saliva and blood spot profile. So this one checks hormone imbalances or vitamin D deficiency that can affect performance, increase injuries, and prevent an athlete from competing at their highest level, right? When it comes to sports, we're either watching it, betting it, or playing it, right? We all, all want our athletes to compete at the highest level, right? And so if our levels are inadequate or deficient, it's going to throw us off. You get that brain fog, you feel fatigued, and you don't know why right? Is it because of lack of sleep? Is it because of something, right? We got to test these levels. Again, these are not cheap. Look how much it costs, $349 for these tests to be run, but they exist. 
And so who benefits from it? Well, people who train for competitions, compete at a high level, feel like they're hitting a wall. How many athletes do you know are here that they, they hit the wall, right? They suffer from nagging or persistent injuries is because they're depleted in some vitamin mineral that they're lacking, right? Now, too much of a good thing is always a bad thing, right? You don't want to be overdosing on vitamins, but you want to have that proper level. That's where testing comes into play. Because if we don't test it, how are we going to know? Okay, now astaxanthin. So I usually ask the audience if they've ever heard of astaxanthin. Usually I'll see like one or two people raise their hands. And you might be thinking, why is there um, a flamingo on this slide? The reason why I put a flamingo on this slide is because astaxanthin is what gives um, the flamingos their, their, their color, okay? And so what is astaxanthin found in? Well, in shellfish, so shrimp, lobster, all the stuff that we like to eat, right? And so as you can see, there's nine health benefits there because it's an antioxidant. For me, what do I care about? Well, all nine are important, but as an eye doctor, what do I care about? Eye health, brain health, and sports health, right? So macular degeneration, cataract, glaucoma, eye fatigue, brain health, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and sports, helps with endurance and prevent muscle and skeletal damage, right? And all the other things that you see on the screen. But estrogen is very important, and we're really taught about it. So here we go. This is in uh, a nutritional um, PubMed article and astaxanthin protects neuronal cells against oxidative damage and is a potent candidate for brain food, right? So when it comes to astaxanthin, these are the different types of uh, dosages that you want. So for the eyes, as little as four to six milligrams per day. But remember, if we're eating salmon, a six ounce of salmon has about 3.6 milligrams of astaxanthin, right? That's why eating fish is very, very important, okay? Um, if you have metabolic syndrome or H. pylori, gastritis, why do these two things occur? Because of your gut. Your gut is misaligned and not getting the appropriate and absorbing the nutrients that it needs, and it causes havoc to many different problems. So if you have these, you want to be supplementing with higher dosages of astaxanthin. Here's another one. In brain resolution in 2017, astaxanthin improves cognitive performance in mice following a mild traumatic brain injury. Well, in sports, what happens? People get hit in the head, especially if you're hitting the ball in soccer, right? So look at the results here. 25 or 75 milligrams for 28 days improved sensory motor performance on neurological severity score, enhanced cognitive function recovery, reduced lesion size and neuronal loss in the cortex, and restored levels of BDNF. If you remember what I talked to you about before, BDNF, what is that? Miracle growth for the brain? Astaxanthin restores those levels. What also has BDNF? Well, I told you already. Dark chocolate, blueberries, extra virgin olive oil, right? Very, very important. So here again, the neuroprotective effects of astaxanthin, therapeutic targets, and astaxanthin as a potential neuroprotective agent for neurological diseases. Well, what are those neurological diseases? Well, Alzheimer's, dementia, all that stuff. But we rarely hear about these things, right? But they're in the studies if you look at them. And so it's very important to be educating our patients about these things. But again, because our primary care doctors are not going to be the ones to tell them about it. It's up to us. We're the last line of defense when it comes to their eye health and their overall health. Now we're going to talk about, oh, that's not, we're going to talk about cognitive decline. I think we got like what, 30 minutes left. So uh, cognitive decline. We already, I already went through it all with you already. Poor sleep, diet. Stress, lack of exercise, lack of nutrients, that's what causes our brains to start to deteriorate, right? And so we got to be, again, more proactive than reactive because why? It's all, it's up to us for our brain to stay healthy. Nobody else is going to care about your brain more than you, right? So whatever you put in your body is what's going to either be good for you or bad for you, right? So when you're young, everything's pretty good, right? But then what happens as we get older? We get waste buildup or we get tau proteins or we get all these different things that can occur, right? And so what happens is, is that people start to forget their everyday tasks and they need help with things. It's not because we get old. That's not really the case. It's because of the way that our bodies are operating and it just starts to give out. So if you look here, this is a map of our country, obviously. And so this is the showing the cognitive decline in the United States. So if you look here, the higher the color blue is, the worse our cognition is in these states. So I'm here in New Jersey at 9.7%. The highest, if, you look, if you're trying to look to see where, what state it is, Nevada is actually the highest at 16.3 with the highest cognitive decline. Coming in second right here is Arkansas, 
This is cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that. And they're like, well, why? You know, now I'll usually ask the audience, um, does anybody know what the most obese state is in the entire United States? And I'll wait to hear an answer. And so I'll give it to you because we're not asking questions here. But the number one state that's obese is actually Mississippi. Mississippi is number one. So 15.2. Now, what does obese mean? Remember, it's about our BMI, that body mass index. So normal is between 18 and like 24.9 is considered normal. Obese is when you're 30 and over for your BMI, right? And also, if you're if you're obese, what does that mean? Well, your vitamin D levels are not being sufficient because it doesn't properly absorb. So Mississippi is number one when it comes to obesity, sadly. And then I'll ask, does anybody know what the lowest amount of obesity, what state is the lowest? And the actual answer is Colorado. So some of you are probably like looking at your spouses or your friends like, oh, we got to move to Colorado. now. Colorado is actually the number, the least obese state in the United States. Now, can those numbers change? Probably. Now, most likely it's the things that they're eating and, and what they grow and whatnot, but that's a different conversation. So remember what I was telling you about, the gut and the brain are connected. Well, the gastrointestinal tract microbiome and potential link to Alzheimer's disease. So when I did this study, and this is in, in uh, neurology, good gut bacteria produces BDNF, GABA, and glutamate. I keep telling you about BDNF. I didn't talk about GABA and glutamate. And so decreased levels of BDNF are found in Alzheimer's, epilepsy, anorexia, depression, OCD, and schizophrenia. So again, the things that we have in our body is what's causing all of these problems, right? And what increases BDNF. Well, again, I told you there's supplements, but also blueberries, dark chocolate, 70% cacao or higher, and extra virgin olive oil. Or if you want to go a step further, you can even go with avocado oil. The reason why avocado oil is better is because, well, it's a healthier saturated fatty acid, but that's not the reason. It's because it actually has a higher burning point, right? And so I can go on and on about the gut. If Wu University decides to have me back to talk about the gut bacteria, I'll be more than happy to, because that's a whole another lecture topic. Um, but again, we're trying to focus on cognitive decline. So again, BDNF and the risk factor for dementia, the Framingham Heart Study was the largest study ever done when it came to the heart. Had about 2,000 adults. All of them were free of dementia. None of them had dementia when they started the study. The results were the individuals with the highest levels of BDNF, remember I keep telling you about BDNF, has less than half the risk of dementia. So it suggests that the role for BDNF can prevent dementia and Alzheimer's disease, right? So very important. So what are the key takeaways that I keep talking about? DHA, carotenoids, BDNF, sleep, lack of stress, all those things are important. Now we're going to talk about real quick, because again, this is a different topic of discussion, neuroinflammation induced by lipopolysaccharides, LPSs. LPS is I want you to think of little pieces of crap, and I won't say the S word, but it's little pieces of crap, because what happens is if your gut is not aligned properly, so think of it like glue. So we have tight junctions in our, in our gut wall, and so what happens is, is that different ingredients, so let's say, for example, if you take an antibiotic, I think in the last lecture, someone was asking about antibiotics and probiotics. Whenever you take an antibiotic, you actually just put a bomb in your gut. So what does that mean? You just got rid of all the good bacteria, but you also took out the bad bacteria with it. So what happens is, is that you just wipe that area out. Little pieces of crap can actually now start to impede. So little holes get into your gut. And now stuff that are not supposed to be there go into your gut lining. And inflammation starts to occur. So that's why whenever you are taking an antibiotic, and remember there's, anti, uh, there's uh, resistance when it comes to too much antibiotic use, right? is what happens is that's why when you have uh, females, when they take an antibiotic, they can get a yeast infection is because the gut lining just got messed up, right? That's one of the reasons. So that's why when you ever take an antibiotic, you actually want to take, um, like I usually tell patients to have a yogurt whenever they take an antibiotic, whether they're taking Doxy, Cipro, whatever, right? You want to have yogurt with it, or if they want to take sauerkraut, for people who like sauerkraut, because it's anything fermented, right? It's very, very important. So anyways, Back to the LPS, so I'm on a little blurb there, but um, so injections of LPS animals bodies lead to overwhelm overwhelming learning deficits. Rats develop elevated levels of beta amyloid in their hippocampus, which remember the hippocampus is what's important for their memory. And LPS shown to decrease production of BDNF. 
And what do I keep telling you about BDNF? Well, all these things play a role, right? And so what it comes down to is nutrition, health, exercise, all that stuff. Now we're talking about, uh, what did I want to go with this? Oh, um, just as you can see in the study, again, this is neuroimmunology. The results here was that there is three times as much LPS in the plasma of Alzheimer's patients as in healthy controls, right? So the more LPS you have in your body, the more cognitive decline you're going to experience. And what causes LPS? Well, an unhealthy gut. Again, BDNF, I keep talking about it. A key molecule for memory in the healthy and the pathological brain. Okay, and this is in neuroscience in 2019. Now, I remember I was telling you about astaxanthin. Well, this is a clinical trial that's being done currently. So don't say that astaxanthin helps with Alzheimer's. There is a study going on that's trying to see if it actually can help with Alzheimer's disease. So that's a clinical trial ongoing currently. Now, we got 15 minutes, no, 25 minutes, sorry. I'm gonna talk about six different ingredients quickly. Now, I don't want you to say, oh, each of these ingredients individually there's a supplement out there that actually has all of these incorporated into one, but I just want to share with you what these ingredients are, okay? Because you see ginkgo biloba, and I say half the people like uh, having a hissy fit over there. But ginkgo biloba, if you look, these are studies done in India, though, but they examined the brain cognitive effects of ginkgo biloba extract, right? And so it studies on dementia, okay? So as you can see, so ginkgo biloba supports many different parts of the body. But again, the one that I focus more on is supports the brain's repair for physical trauma and help with, with working memory deficits in the elderly. Again, so we need that support, the inflammation response, because if anything's happening with inflammation, our body is starting to deteriorate. So ginkgo biloba is actually um, one of those ingredients that I'm going to get into. Okay. So remember, don't take them separately. I'm going to get into it. Next is curcumin. I'm sure many of you are now like, oh, yes, curcumin is great. Yes. So different studies on uh, done for Alzheimer's disease. So the effect of curcumin on Alzheimer's and a potential role of the curry spice curcumin in Alzheimer's disease, right? And so the cool thing about curcumin is that it has anti-cancer properties. So this is a little, um, uh, little advice for you guys in the audience. Um, curcumin and black pepper, if you were to like put those together in a, a dish or a food that you're making, that actually helps tremendously with your brain and inflammation to lower it. So whenever you're cooking, I highly recommend that you add um, black pepper and curcumin together, whatever dish, because it helps with your brain. So again, it provides brain building compounds and helps support detoxification from heavy metals and mold exposure. So again, curcumin's one of those six key ingredients that I'm mentioning about. Um, another study here, short-term curcumin supplementation enhances, again, what did I tell you, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's why curcumin, it's, one, it's actually a very expensive spice. The most expensive spice is actually saffron. And so, again, these are very, very important when it comes to our brain. Another one is called coffee fruit extract. So, again, I know I'm going a little out there, but um, these are from the coffee beans, the coffee fruit extract. And so I actually got some of this information from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. And you can look up other different ingredients on it as well. Um, it's a pretty cool um, site. But anyways, this is a neuropsychology development cognition. Cognitive short and long-term effects of coffee cherry extract in older adults with mild cognitive decline. And again, what does coffee fruit extract help with? Well, it helps fuel your BDNF, which what I tell you, it's in your brain and your spinal cord and it helps boost your nerve transmissions. Okay, and so 100 to 100 milligrams were well tolerated. And so if you consumed it for 28 days, it, it actually increased your reaction timing, right? And so again, this is the fourth one or third one. This is the fourth one, I believe, uh, phosphatidylserine. So we all know about phosphatidylcholine. Well, there's phosphatidylserine and the brain. This is a nutrition in 2015. And so um, what's important here is phosphatidylcholine, or, oh, sorry, Phosphatidylserine helps with our myelin, that nerve, the, the axons and our nerve fibers. Well, we need that myelin fiber because that adds like a connection. It reinforces the connection from the, our brain to the different cells of our body, right? So those tied together, if we have a strong connection, the, the, the better our brain is going to be able to react and all that. Um, so again, it supports human cognitive functions, including the formation of short-term memory, the consolidation of long-term memory, the ability to create new memories, the ability to retrieve memories, the ability to learn and recall information, the ability to focus attention and concentrate, the ability to reason and solve problems, language skills, and the ability to communicate, right? And so 
again, another key component is phosphatidyl serine. And you can find all these different foods um, that you can see here. Next is go to cola. This is actually known as um, an herb of longevity. And so again, I know I'm going out there again, uh, but in this study, it showed that 1,000 milligrams per day and 750 milligrams per day is effective in improving cognitive impairment after a stroke. But they said that it's not more beneficial than a therapy of folic acid. So remember, folic acid was vitamin B9, remember, for people who are pregnant. Um, so again, it showed better improvement in delayed memory recall compared with folic acid. So it did have a little bit of, of, of use. But again, remember, don't take these separately. I'm saying to put them together, and I'll explain to you in a second. Last is propolis. Propolis is actually a substance that bees actually make. Um, so if without bees, we would actually probably be extinct. Bees are very, very important to our atmosphere. But um, there are studies showing that the neuroprotective effects of Brazilian green propolis on neurodegenerative damage in our neuronal cells, right? And so it, with this, it helps to reduce our oxidative stress, neurodegenerative damage synapses, all that stuff. And so no side effects were shown. And it's a very safe food because we all have honey, right? We all know that Manuka honey is probably the number one honey to use, especially because of the healing properties that it has, anti-cancer properties and all that stuff. So bees, very, are, yeah, bees are very, very important to our environment. And we got like 20 minutes left. I got like a few more slides. Um, so there's a study, look at this, in biomedicine in 2021, just recently uh, came out last year. And so this is actually a study, not only to help with cognitive decline, but to actually reverse Alzheimer's disease. Yes, I said that, to actually reverse Alzheimer's disease. So there's an ongoing study currently happening. There's actually six stages on Alzheimer's. Now, again, I know I'm giving you a small blurb on Alzheimer's disease. Again, I could do a different topic on Alzheimer's disease, but I'm just going to share with you the, the different types here. So type number one, when it comes to Alzheimer's, is inflammation. So you have the hot one. Two, trophic loss is considered the cold form of Alzheimer's, okay? So the inflammation is, um, you know, just leak, like uh, your gut being inflamed, that kind of stuff. That's inflammation. That's type one. That's what majority of the discussion was on the gut lining in the brain. Number two is trophic loss. So this is trophic loss, meaning loss of vitamins and minerals. That's why I went into a whole gamut of the whole lineup in, in, in line so that you understand what I'm talking about. Next is glidocidal toxicity. The reason is why it's 1.5 is because it's a combination of both inflammation and trophic loss. It's a combination of both type one and type two. So you have glidocidal toxicity and that's because of the sugar levels, too much sugar users that we're having. Number three is um, uh, toxicity. Then we got vasculature, so abnormal blood flows into the body. And then lastly is trauma. So why does it happen? Well, if you have too many blood um, concussions or traumatic brain injuries, that tau protein in your brain starts to accumulate and that can cause not only depression or suicidal thoughts, it can lead a lot of different things, right? And so brain disease is actually very important. What is helpful in the brain? What I keep talking about? Well, sleep, exercising, nutritional supplements, vitamins, BDNF, all these things, very, very important, right? And so they actually did another, this is part of the study. Uh, so aducanumab, I don't know if I said it correctly, but that's, that drug actually came out last year to actually help, to help people with Alzheimer's disease. And so this is the no treatment group versus the actual treatment group with Alzheimer's. And so as you can see, very, 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 very minimal help when it came to Alzheimer's disease. Well, this trial is going on right now. Remember those six ingredients that I just shared with you? Well, all six of those ingredients are in one formula and they're trying it out. And this is the trial right here. And as you can see, the change in cognitive score has not only not only minimized it, but has actually improved it. So again, how do we know about this or how do we find out about this? Well, I actually got to meet him personally. Um, this is a world renowned neurologist, Dr. Dale Bredesen. He actually wrote books and the end of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline, right? And again, it talks about the nutritional side, the side of things, because we're not taught that. We're taught about, we're taught about being um, the fire department, drugs and surgery. Our job is to become the carpenter to find out what is causing the problem to even start this, right? In school, we always were taught to find the underlying cause, right? So what is the underlying cause? Whenever we prescribe an antibiotic and they got rid of their infection, well, we got rid of the infection, but what caused the infection to start with? 
right? And so we got to get to the bottom line of it so that we know what's going on. And how do we do that? By testing, right? You got to get blood work done. You got to get your vitamins tested, all that stuff. So you got to know, or you got to be asking your patients what vitamins they're on, what medicines they're on, you know, all these different things, right? Because again, we are their last line of defense. So um, he's a he's a stud in his industry and he's, he's wealth of information. So I highly recommend if you haven't or, or if you have somebody that you know with Alzheimer's or maybe a family member of yours, that there's a, there's some hope. Obviously, it's sad if they have it, but it's better to prevent it than when they get it, right? So um, you have this in your handouts. This is just a picture of, of different ingredients, of, uh, fruits, vegetables, things that we can have that actually incorporate all of these um in our diet, right? So lutein, zeaxanthin, as we know, is green leafy vegetables, and then beta carotene, anything with like an orangey red type color is your beta carotenes. Sweet potatoes is probably one of the most helpful besides kale. Um, sweet potatoes is actually very, very beneficial for you. So whenever you're in a store or restaurant and they are and they're giving you fries, I highly recommend that you, if they have it, to switch to sweet potato fries, and that's why it costs more. Why do you think it costs more? Because it's healthier for you, right? So again. When it comes to our patients, right, whatever they decide to spend on it, or even for ourselves, our lives are valuable. Things cost more, right? Gas costs more in our cars if we have a fancy car. Things cost more if you want to stay healthy. Now, I get it for our patients who have two, three, four jobs. They don't have time to cook. You know, they just buy Wendy's or McDonald's, and then, you know, the cascade continues and continues, right? Because cheap food is easy to buy. That's why we're the, we're the best country when it comes to medicine but we're the most obese. Because why? Because of the foods that we eat, right? And so again, really, these are different things that you can have. Omega-3s, again, I was telling you about avocado oil because of that burning point. So very important. Anchovies is, is considered a, a superfood. Um, so you have this in your handouts. You can look at it. Um, so this is, my, this is my summary slide. I think I finished it a little early because I know I had a lot of comments and questions, but so you, you don't want to depend on your current healthcare model because again, nobody's going to care about your brain more than, than you, right? And so you got to be the one to find out what is the proper information because one person can say one other thing, you just got to do that research for yourself. And um, many people who have suffered, at least in, in my um, area of expertise or patients that I've had, anytime that I mention um, these ingredients or or I tell them to supplement with something and better sleep, they come back to me and they're like, my brain fog has lifted. All these other um, other things that were that no one ever told me about, and you were the one that told me about it. I came in for an eye exam, but you actually told me about health. Like that's unlikely or unheard of, right? So we gotta be different because again, why don't we talk about nutrition? The real reason is because no one teaches it to us in school. That's the real answer, right? And so an investment in good sleep is an investment in a healthy gut. Because again, remember the gut and the brain are tied together. And the last take home is our brain is our garden and the roots are nurtured by the food that we eat. Because remember food is our medicine, right? And so back in the early 1900s or the, before the fifties, right? The food that we eat now is not the same that we ate in the fifties. Why? Because of the different pesticides that they put in the, the ground. Or now it's agricultural business, right? More so than what's healthy for us, right? And so if you were to go into a supermarket and you see all these different ingredients of stuff, you really want to avoid those middle aisles because those middle aisles are pretty much made up of corn, right? High fructose corn syrup or monosodium glutamate or all those things. All those things in the middle aisles, they're manufactured by chemicals and they actually affect our brain. The best thing that we can have is fruits and vegetables, um, fatty fish, grass-fed meats, uh, pasture-raised eggs, right? As adults, we really shouldn't be drinking milk. Um, the top, the top two reasons for allergies is gluten and milk, right? And because of the casein in milk. So, um, very, very important, um, for us to educate and, and, and inspire our patients so that they live better and healthier lives. So, um, and that's, then that's pretty much the last thing I got. So that's my email on the bottom. Any questions? Awesome. That was an awesome doctor, uh, presentation, Dr. Minna. I wish that we had more of that because I feel like just like in um, medical school and optometry school, we don't really get much. And the window being the health and the eye being the window into the health of our body, it's so important that we have good background information on this. So thank you. Um, we do have a lot of great questions. 
So do you ever recommend doing, you know, genetic testing to know what patients may be predisposed to, or, you know, how you can do, um, oh gosh, what's it called where you can look at your family tree and kind of know what you might have a risk. Yeah, factor for and yeah, some no, that. yeah, great. That's a great question for sure. Yeah. So genetic testing is actually crucial. So there are some lectures that they, they have for genetic testing. Um, um, that is something that I do, I would recommend to a patient to go seek out uh, just genetic testing because a lot of times 10% of the illnesses are because of genetics. A lot of times we just say like, oh, high blood pressure is in your family. Oh, you have, it's a genetic thing, right? But really genetics is really only 10% of the problems in our bodies. And so, yes, you want to find that out because if you have, like, say for Alzheimer's, so Alzheimer's disease, there's a genetic component to it. There's different alleles and all that stuff. And so if they have that gene, sadly, it is what it is, right? So being able to find that out is, is important, you know? Now, I'll, I'll joke with people and I'll joke, but I'll just tell people, you like, before you get genetic testing, I would highly recommend, this is a different topic, um, I'll actually tell them, you want to actually, if you don't have life insurance, want to get life insurance first before you know if you have a problem because once you find out you have a problem then you're not qualifying for life insurance god forbid you have something right so usually if you're going to get genetic testing people don't think like that i would actually say hey if you're going to do uh if you have life insurance or anything like that well then just get it before you actually get genetic testing done because you want to not know before you know you know but yes you, i would highly recommend getting genetic testing um for that yep okay great um, and if, if they did testing and they determined that they were at risk for macular degeneration, how would you kind of guide them for supplementation or, or diet modifications? Yeah. So again, um, again, I tell patients all the time, like, you know, our, our eyes are the windows of our soul. And again, the brain and the eye are connected. So a lot of times, most of the complaints that patients give us are what dryness and headaches usually. Those are the main ones, right? Where I get a migraine, you know, high strain and things like that. So we just chalk it up to different things. But no, none of the times we talk about their sleep pattern, do they talk about um, their eating habits, what minerals they're on and things like that. So usually what I'll say is you want to be on a high, uh, high dose quality fish oil. That's number one. Number two is you want to be on a, on a carotenoid supplement with mesozeaxanthin, not just any carotenoid, but with mesozeaxanthin in it. Um, then I tell them about the importance of um, sleep, like I keep mentioning, and then um, different things that they can incorporate into their diets. You know, so like, for example, if they're eating a lot of fat, uh, fried foods, try to minimize that as much as we can, or drink more water. If you don't like just bland water, seltzer water, you know, it just depends on what their lifestyle is and things like that. Great. And then let's see here. For specific recommendations of over-the-counter vitamins, um, how do you really know how bioavailable available some of these supplements are? You know, the labels can tell you anything. And are there any particular brands that you specifically recommend because of that that trust? Yeah. So, for an, for example, so for vitamins for a B for a B complex, you remember you just want to have all the Bs um, incorporated together. You just don't want to have just one B six, right? So, just getting a B complex. Usually, you want the ones that are like 30, 40 bucks, usually, because the ones that are cheaper are not going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. So, try to find that. Um, so that's for vitamins. So for like an N or for a probiotic, I'll usually get um, Now Foods is a, is a good one. Another one is called Align when it comes to probiotics um, for those kind of things. And uh, vitamin D3, um, there's a, usually those cost between, yeah, same price, about 30, 50 bucks for the vitamin D. Again, they're expensive, but again, it comes down to what our body needs, right? So if you don't be more proactive and pay for it now, you're gonna pay for it down the road, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I have those conversations a lot. I know it's expensive, but yeah, right, yeah, I know it's a, it's a hard conversation to to have, but you have it. Just it should be like everyday practice in a way. You know, you get good at it the more you do it. Right. So for some of the tests that you could test um, vitamin levels, if if uh, OD is in a state that they're unable to order those tests, how do you recommend they, they get it done? Sure. Yeah. So there's actually, this is shocking. So chiropractors, you wouldn't expect chiropractors. They actually do some of these types of testings. So you're going to just call and see your local chiropractor and see if they do any of that stuff, because there's a lot of wellness people out there that actually um, incorporate these different things. 
So that'd be one. Number two is I actually recommend people see a gastroenterologist if they have all of these things, because it, there's not many gastroenterologists, but those appointments can take some time to get there. But I would highly recommend number one is a chiropractor, because if our, if our spine is not in alignment, that can actually throw things off, right? So it's not just one thing. It's a whole different things that, that are affecting each other. So number one is the gut and the brain, your spine. Um, so chiropractor and gastroenterology would be my top two things that I would recommend um, you send the patient to. Okay, awesome. I love that. For Is there a supplement that's available for the, the study that you mentioned with Alzheimer's where there were this, those particular six ingredients? Do you know if there's a supplement available that had the, has those? Yes, it's called NeuroQ. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And then, um, this doc asked about rhodiola supplementation with rhodiola. Actually, I'm, I'm actually not aware to be honest. I'll actually have to look that one up. Okay. I'll write that down. Um, let's see here. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the connection of the eye with Alzheimer's is always really fascinating to me. You know, the advances with OCTA and potentially being able to see biomarkers before, um, you know, they become actively have have dementia. I think that that's some really cool, a really cool area of, um, evolving, uh, interest right now. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm trying to, I'm coming up with a lecture for um, AMD and Alzheimer's together. So I'm trying to put that one together. So we'll see. Oh, well, we can't wait to see it. <laughs> cool. yeah. um, so we have a, oh, uh, you said it was called NeuroQ, that specific supplement for mm-hmm. Alzheimer's. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Neuro- one of them. Yeah. I would, you know, I would definitely do your research again um, on it. You know, it's, Again, it's different. It's a different um, wheelhouse than we're used to. You know? mm-hmm. So it, I find it funny though, because you know, if uh, we recommend a vitamin or a supplement, to, a supplement to people, we're always like, "Oh, let me research that. Let me do my information." But if we give somebody a, a certain type of food that might be harmful for us, oh, let me try that. You mm-hmm. know, they're not second guessing it. You know, we don't know what the ingredients that we're eating in our body, but we're going to research something that's going to be beneficial or healthy for us. So it's kind of like backwards thinking in a way. For sure. Do you know of any resources that are available that you could, you know, say a patient has severe inflammatory dry eye and instead of doing all of that counseling in the room, do you know of any resources that are available to, you know, that have recommendations on diet and supplementation? Well, resources in in comparison to dryness, um, again, it's, where does dryness come from? Inflammation, right? And my bulimian glands and all that stuff, right? We know that. But again, we're not talking about the nutritional side of things because what's causing the inflammation to begin with. So again, that comes down to finding out what's happening in your gut because once that's restored, your dryness will start to heal up. And so that's where that gastroenterology comes into play. Of course, there's different gadgets that helps to you know, stop it. Those are very beneficial and crucial, right? Um, but again, we gotta get to the bottom line of what's causing the inflammation. Nothing that we're giving is stopping the inflammation really. You know, um, we're providing these services, which is good for the patient and also for um, for our bank, for our buck in our offices. But again, we really got to come down to that that bottom line. You know, majority of times people are just saying, you know, artificial tears, but that's just very minimal. Mm-hmm. Um, really, again, food is the medicine to heal ourselves. For sure. Yeah, I always find it interesting that sometimes if I recommend a really good quality fish oil supplement to a patient, how oftentimes they're you know, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms improve. Yeah. I mean, they don't have as much. Yeah. Drug. yeah. Well, the reason why, well, all autoimmune conditions are actually um, caused because you have an unhealthy gut. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, anyways, I saw that question. Oh yeah. Do you recommend taking supplements for those who don't have max degeneration or have a family history? So, um, so yes. Yeah, so again, we got to be more proactive than reactive. So again, do you start, why do you, why would you work out? Is that what, I guess I would ask a patient, right? Some people like just cause they like doing it. Other people, cause I like to look healthy and stuff, right? If you don't work out, what's going to happen? you start put on some weight, you know, whatever, right? If you start taking care of your health now, you're not going to get those issues down the road, right? Unless you're that part of that 10% that just have that genetic composition in you that just, it is what it is. 
So you want to be more proactive. So don't wait until something occurs. Start now, because again, when it comes to macular degeneration, remember, we're nearsighted on the fact about macular degeneration. I want you to forget it exists for a moment because carotenoids and fish oils help with our brain and we see with our, our brain. And so we want to pr protect our cognition for down the road. So we should be taking it anyways, whether you have it or you don't have it. So that would be my advice. Well, someone asked, what does it mean wild caught? You're still fine, they release down and catch it. So wild caught means, so whenever you, they catch a fish, they just caught it that day and they take it back. So wild caught means they're there in their natural environment. Farm raised means they caught the fish, but the fish is actually still living in the sea, but they're actually in a big net, a huge net. But now, now can there's other fish that they normally eat go through the net? Yes. But those fish are actually given different feed than they're normally used to eating. So that's what farm raised means. And so that's why you want wild caught because wild caught means that they're naturally eating the things that they want. Uh, that was news to me. <laughs> but yeah, obviously makes a big difference. Um, kind of like, you know, with grass fed cows, if you eat that meat, it has a lot yeah. more omega yeah. index in it. Yeah, that's very true. Cool. Well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, so thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And, um, I know I learned a ton and uh, it looks like, you know, we had a lot of amazing feedback, a lot of great questions. So thank you for your time.